Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are now starting our last keynote uh, lecture from the Linguistics Summer School 2024, broadcasting from the Federal University of Trujillo, Florida. Um, this morning, we will have the talk by Professor Mark Turner. But before I can introduce our guest, I'd like to uh, share with you some thank you notes. So this has been a crazy week uh, for us. And it was only possible because we had the help from lots and lots of people and institutions. So I'll start by thanking both Abralin and Capis, our partners in this uh, event. This wouldn't have happened without those partnerships. But I would also like to thank once again all the team that worked uh, with us, both here in Fujifara and remotely, to make it all possible. Okay? Então, bom dia a todo mundo. Nós estamos aqui no nosso último dia né, da Escola de Linguística de Verão, transmitida pela Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora. Hoje a gente tem a conferência de encerramento, né, administrada pelo professor Mark Turner. Mas antes de a gente passar a palavra para o nosso convidado, eu precisava agradecer novamente o apoio que recebemos da Brainha da Capes para a realização desse evento. Seria impossível ter realizado sem esse apoio, um evento né, dessa magnitude, dessa proporção. Dizer que foi uma semana louca para a gente aqui, é, para fazer todas as adequações necessárias, né, cobrir todas as emergências e reforçar mais uma vez o agradecimento que eu fiz para a equipe fantástica aqui da UFJF e também da Alain, que trabalhou junto com a gente durante esse período. Um, as also a thank you for people who been watching us, uh, Mark and Arthur and I will be uh, sending Abraham a copy of our latest book, Pop Pilots for Linguists, a signed copy, uh, to be raffled in the Abraham Instagram. Então, também como uma forma de agradecimento a todo mundo que é, nos assistiu nesse período, ou aqui ou online, é, o Mark, o Arthur e eu vamos fazer uma cópia assinada do nosso último livro, do Pop Pilots for Linguists, vamos enviar para Abraham para ser sorteado através do Instagram da Abraham. So just go to Abralin at Abralin on Instagram, and then you can find next week the instructions to take part in the raffle. Então, só vão até o Instagram da Abralin, o arroba Abralin, e semana que vem vão estar lá as instruções sobre como participar da rifa. Ok? I will now uh, give the floor to Evandra Bicoleto, the Vice President of the Brazilian Association for Linguistics, for her uh, introduction words and thank you words. Vou passar então a palavra para Evandra, para suas palavras de agradecimento. Obrigada, Thiago. Bom dia a todas e todos. Né? Estou aqui representando a diretoria da Bralim, sou, estou né, atualmente na vice-presidência da nossa Associação Brasileira de Linguística e gostaria só de né, fazer uma, uma fala bem breve, né? agradecer essa parceria com a Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora, o Programa de Linguística, né, especialmente aí ao professor Tiago, que foi o nosso parceiro nessa ação. É, a gente, enquanto diretoria, tem repensado um pouco as ações da Bralim em termos do que nós tínhamos como chamadas escolas de verão. Né? Então, teremos aí outras atividades ao longo do ano, em parceria com outras universidades também, de modo que a gente pretende né, é, atender as diferentes regiões do país nesse sentido. né? Então, realmente só uma fala de agradecimento, um agradecimento especial também ao professor Anderson e ao professor Guilherme, que estão aqui, né, Anderson, que é nosso colega na Federal de Pernambuco, e que tá, nos ajudou muito, né, para que a gente pudesse tornar esse, esse evento acessível às, às pessoas surdas, né, é, e desejar aí, a gente sabe que o evento foi um sucesso, pelo que a gente acompanhou nas redes, né, o da semana, né, e desejar a todo mundo aí um, uma boa finalização, né, com essa conferência, né, com um tema tão interessante do professor Mark Turner. Então, é isso, muito obrigada, espero que a gente possa é, né, desenvolver outras parcerias aí no futuro, Tiago. Obrigado, Evandra. So, uh, you are not here to listen to us, you are here to to Mark Turner. So, a brief introduction. 
Uh, Mark Turner is a professor at Case Western Reserve University in the Department of Cognitive Science. But before that, so this guy has been writing the longest path of success in cognitive science like ever. So uh, he's a doctor honoris causa from the University of Haute Alsace. And before joining Case, he was a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland and associate director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. He's also the founding director of the Cognitive Science Network, the co-director of the Red Hand Lab, and the winner of the Enelis Meyer Research Prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, winner of Prix du Royaume de la Langue et de la Littérature Française from the French Academy, founding president of the Mayfield Institute for Cognition and the Arts, Fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study, the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, the National Humanities Center, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Institute of Advanced Study at Durham University, the Center for Advanced Study at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the New England Institute for Cognitive Science and Evolutionary Psychology, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute for the Science of Origins. He is an extraordinary member of the Humanistic Center of the Ludwig Maximilians University. He's an external research professor of the Krausel Institute for Advanced Study, visiting scholar from the Department of Linguistics at Stanford, and visiting scholar from the Department of Linguistics and Cognitive Science from the University of California at San Diego. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at the Hunan Normal University in China, but that's not how I'm going to introduce him. Because if you know this guy, as I have the privilege, you know, you know that he likes to be introduced as just a surfer boy from Southern California. Please. Thank you, Chago, for that introduction, which my mother would have loved. <laughs> she would have said, not a very good surfer. Bon dia, and welcome to the last act of the linguistic summer school. We have to thank Professor Torrent not only for his vision, intelligence, and energy, but also for his wit, charm, and eloquence. We thank the entire torrential team of organization here at the University, Federal University of Uruguay. We thank the Faculty of Letters and Higher University, uh, Federal University of Jujutora, and we must thank Arvadin, the Brazilian Association for Linguistics, which, as you know, has been an invaluable support for linguistics in the world for the past several years. Well, I am all that is standing between you and a great Brazilian lunch, so let's get started. I living in a new age now. That's the audio chat. It works. I am living in a new age here. Uh, so I've been doing this for well over 50 years. And the question might be, how do we study communication? These days, we do it by raffling my research through Instagram, right? That's not the way it, it used to be. You would think that the way we study communication is by actually looking at how people communicate, by getting data and studying it. You know, you want to study all of these many fabulous Brazilian birds, the frigate birds that fly <coughs> over the beach of Copacabana. Right? You look at the birds. You would count the birds and measure the birds and try to figure out which birds were related to what birds. And think it was quite complicated and would be humble. Well, that's not how I was trained for the most part until I found some people who could train me that way. So we're talking about a question of usage and a respect for the data. But I'm going to give you a little bit of the strange history of the study of communication, the one in which I was deeply trained. I have a BA and an MA in mathematics from Berkeley, and at the time, we tended to think that mathematics was the key to the study of communication. 
no surprise, the Pythagoreans thought mathematics was the key to everything because when you figured out that you could explain music as ratios between the lengths and strings, that you could in fact predict something about astronomy by using this strange thing called mathematics. Soon we had a tradition of thinking that behind it all, it's numbers. Somehow we can figure out numbers like one and zero. I'm getting a little bit of uh, reverb here, but as we all know, audio is just ones and zeros. Right? So I'm going to introduce you very quickly to the history of what I call the grand interconnected trio in the mid 20th century, which was immensely influential. It accounts for a fair amount of my early life. But the truth conditional theory of maintaining the discovery of computer logic gates and the neuron doctrine. So this comes from mathematical, philosophical, formal linguistics, from electrical engineering. As you know, computer science began in electrical engineering departments, and neuroscience. So I was hanging out in all of these fields at Berkeley when I was 17. And what did she, Mark, earn? Well, before the interconnected trio, uh, two-cent version of philosophy of meaning, idea was that meaning was somehow a matter of mental representations and intentions. Okay? But along comes truth conditions. Now, truth conditions are very important. And you know all about them. Syllogisms in classical antiquity were a branch of the study of truth conditions. So here is a proposition. We're beginning to enter the world in which communication is propositional. It's about speaking truth about morality or about reality. Speaking truth about reality and knowing the difference between true statements and false statements. Well, if you accept that all in our world, we are then we must pause and reflect upon our mortality. <laughs> Not about the mortality about YouTube. Nope, nope. So not about the mortality about YouTube. So people on YouTube are telling us that they're getting a very low sound and a real echo. The worst of both worlds. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be posting the link to the Zoom webinar to the YouTube chat. OK? And then people can join as participants. Right? Okay, people? You've just been promoted. We'll give you a sticker. We all have nice stickers. I should show you the stickers that people get. So after you spend an entire week listening to foreign linguists, well, you get well, you get a sticker. And you can enter an Instagram raffle. Right? You motivated? Yeah. You're going to let me know when we are ready. Yes. Listos? No. No. OK. So I'll just give you a little background here in the room, right? So I go up. It's, uh, it's the 60s. And I have, I'm, I'm 16. I'm just turning 17. But I'm done with high school because I can't stand it anymore. And I go up, and I see Berkeley. I hitchhiked up. This is 800 kilometers from San Diego. I had been to the Bay Area before because there was no good coffee or bread in San Diego when I was a child. So we just had to get in the car and drive to San Francisco, which was 750 kilometers away. We would go to North Beach in San Francisco where they actually had like five pieces of meat food. Now we had fabulous food in San Diego. It was all Mexican. So I was raised on Mexican. Albertos, Robertos, Hidibertos, Hidibertos, number 17. And you know, you would eat the taco. And after you digested it, you would go down to the beach. And then afterward, you'd go and get the 
Rito. That was pretty much my life. I grew up, you're going to let us know what we're back. I, I pretty much grew up um, on the beach and in the desert of uh, San Diego. And I didn't know anybody who knew anything. There was no University of California. There, there was Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Right? And so uh, I, I was, I love the beach, and I love looking at people in the beach. But during that whole time, I noticed that people are really weird. They, what are they doing? They're talking. They're standing a little bit, looking at each other, they're making jokes. They, they say, well, you know, tomorrow we should drive up to Malibu so we can surf, plan to go up to Malibu. Now, you might think that this is just paradise, but I noticed the seagulls were not doing this, and the dogs were not doing this. And the dolphins, even, were very smart in not doing this. Uh, how could we be doing this? And mostly, what I got from everybody is, what's the problem? It's easy. A two-year-old can do this. Right? Well, nobody really wanted to study linguistics. Well, I didn't know the word. What's the problem? A kid learns. How do you learn? Well, you hear your parents talk, and you say what they said. Mark. Please, in life. <laughs> yeah, in life. Um, in fact, I, I wrote about this in, a, in, a, in an interview. I was interviewed about this. Uh, so I didn't have any idea how to, what to study. But math seemed really interesting to me. So you got to understand that there I am on the beach in board shorts or out in the desert. Right? My idea of fun was, well, you're learning Latin. Well, why not? You know, much later I read Alex Huxley talking about how pain he was whenever he saw a Latin grammar book. It reminded him of his childhood in which he was forced to learn Latin. But I wasn't forced to do anything because nobody knew any Latin. I had managed to find a book. I didn't really know what a library was either. Okay. Uh, so some days it was Latin, some days it was. Uh, Calculus, some days, it's just random stuff, these things called brains. And the reason I decided that someday I'd like to go to Berkeley is they did everything, right? It was a universal campus. They, they had everything. I thought, okay, I can figure it out here. So then, of course, as one had to do, I hitchhiked across the United States with my 18-pound, you know, uh, nine-kilogram backpack. That was it. And I made money by helping to build a post office. Just stopped various places and got little jobs, doing some landscaping. In those days, you could just have a very little bit of money. And you could go to Europe, months and months and months, which I did. And I was curious. So I you know, would go to Catholic churches where I could still hear the mass in Latin. I'm not Catholic, but half of my friends were Mexican growing up. And they were Catholic. And they heard the mass in Latin. And I finally got uh, no, no, decided, no, okay, no. I've had enough of that. And at Berkeley, I had picked up an application. This is the days of it's all paper. And I filled out the application by hand in Paris, and I sent it to Berkeley. I didn't have a clue how this worked. And then I made my way back to San Diego and, and drove up to Berkeley in a in a in a car that I had rebuilt. That's what we used to do, is rebuild cars in the, on the beaches of San Diego. You know, have a taco, wrench a little. I drove up and uh, slept in the car. And the next morning, went into the admissions office at Berkeley and said, uh, hi, can I see the director of come back at two because she's looking up. So I went in and I said, hi, did I get in? Do I get to start? And he said, yes, but not now. You have to start in the spring semester. And this person just took great care of me. And 
helped me out and I talked about how to learn and what to do. So I was taking courses in English linguistics and I took courses in mathematics and I took courses in biology and courses in computer science. And fine, and I just thought I was getting an education. And finally, um, some associate dean in the College of Letters and Sciences sent me a message that I had to come see her. Yeah. No. And yeah. I did. Bill? And she yeah. said, Bill? No. You must pick I a major. You no. can't no. just no. keep no. doing no. this. No. <laughs> I said, Well, what major do I pick? No. And so we sorted it out, and no. she agreed no. that it was all right if I picked two. So I picked math and see, English I linguistics. I think she um, and okay. that's what my BA, my BAs were in. And uh, there's no one my age who has a degree in cognitive science that didn't exist back then. And in fact, the combination of cognitive science that became cognitive science didn't arise until I was back in graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school until I took two years off to go to the beach in San Diego, I lived in Pacific Beach, where I read some more stuff, which was really useful. I recommend this to all students, because then by the time I got back to Berkeley to get my PhD, I knew what I wanted to do and how to do it. It included some math and computer science, so I did get an MA in math, um, but it also included some neurobiology and uh, linguistics. The other reason I took two years off is most of the graduates I knew at Berkeley were pretty depressed. I thought that this was the difference between bright, sunny Southern California, where we had good waves and Mexican food and sun, and Berkeley, which was kind of cold. <laughs> and, you know, there's no surfing. So, and there was no Mexican food to speak of, so no wonder they were a little depressed. And I didn't want to become like a depressed graduate student. So I went back to San Diego for a couple of years, and the math was done. Then I went back to Berkeley, and I got through as fast as I could, because I didn't want to be sucked into the black hole of depressed graduate student film. And also, you know, I wanted to stay warm. And that's why, when I took a job, I went to the University of Chicago, where I nearly froze to death. I had no idea how to handle the cold. But luckily, I met this girl, Megan, who's sitting in the back, who taught me how to layer and stay warm. And uh, her phrase is, God sent me to Chicago okay. uh, for five years, because thereafter, every place would look warm to me. Yeah. We ready? Hey, torrential team. Yes. Uh, are you about to? Do we have the thunderclap? The Turner Tornado. Okay, so it's coming. So your microphone is just for the transmission. Your My microphone is just for the transmission. You said people will have to deal with my inaudible voice. Okay? If you can't hear me, just, you know, waggle your head. We've got uh, the sound engineers are consulting. Mark, okay. yes. could you turn off your mic? I certainly could, sir. And I'm going to do something to you that you have to forgive me. Okay. Okay, everyone. So does everybody listen to me now? Both on Zoom and on YouTube. You all hear him. Right? I've got all the system. All right. And YouTube people, is that okay? Check on the select level. Or we don't chat to YouTube people. So, see the advantages of not being in a video conference. You had the opportunity to be bored to death with this Perfect. vain, glorious stuff about tacos. Okay? And you can remove this from you. Thank heaven. But you cannot leave this spot. Boy, these guys. Well, <laughs> one cannot have everything in. You know that. Who says? Uh, technology. Okay, it's technology. <laughs> Can't always get what you want. Here we are, slaves to technology, right? So the reason I can't move from here is there's some microphone somewhere picking me up, and it's probably one in the one in this camera. Is that right? No, the one it's in your computer. <laughs> my computer is actually <laughs> broadcasting. Boy, 
See, what would you do without me? Okay. <laughs> Okay, now that I've solved everything. <laughs> okay, back back to the study of meaning. And the study of meaning in a formal way by thinking about truth conditions, right? So if you know, thank you, by the way, to the torrential team for solving even the hardest of problems. I hope you were entertaining everybody uh interpreter during that entire little that was planned by the way um okay so if you know all men are mortal and socrates is a man you can conclude that socrates is mortal and you can do this in a purely formal way uh you cannot imagine the influence of books like alfred tarski's the concept of truth in formalized languages there are a lot of other people in this field. You look them up. And the basic notion, which we memorized a million times, is knowing the meaning of a sentence, is knowing the conditions under which it would be true. So this is a truth conditional idea of meaning. So if Bob speaks Chinese and Mary speaks Chinese, and you know those are both true, then you know automatically that Bob and Mary can speak Chinese together. What other such patterns of truth conditional computation could there be? So we studied a lot about this. When I say it's formal, I mean, if person A speaks language L and person B speaks language L, you can conclude that person A and person B can speak language L together. In fact, one of the things you know is if A and B, then A and B, right? Cool. So, hey, we're really making a lot of progress on getting to a theory of meaning. Aha. This could be connected to truth tables. So, of course, we invented the wonderful idea taken from the Pythagoreans that falsity is a big zero and truth is one. Right? This is an opposition in the world. Something is either true or false. It's either one or zero. And you could get the meaning in these tables. So for instance, if it's zero and zero, and what you're doing is and the and logical operator. So if A and B, what's the truth of A and B? Well, the answer is if A, so it's true, and if B, it's true, then A and B is true, right? So if they're both false, then A and B is false. So if it's false that uh, Mary can speak English and it's false that Bob can speak English, then it is false that Mary and Bob can speak English, right? Zero, zero produces zero. Zero, one also produces zero under an and logical operator. One and zero also produces zero. The only case in which and operator produces truth is if both of the inputs are true. If A and B are both true, then A and B. Major discovery, huh? Okay. There's an entire tradition, Bertrand Russell, Alfred North Whitehead, all, all kinds of other uh, folks um, investigating these operators. There are and operators, or operators, and not operators, right? And you can combine them. And indeed, uh, Bertrand Russell and others made the great discovery that all of these logical computations can be just sequences of one operation. That is not and. It's not the case. If A and B are true, it's not the case that A and B are true. That's not and. Because not and is and, and not outputs the opposite of any other operator. So not and is, as I'll show you, got a certain truth table. And in fact, all these others, nor and so on, can be produced. So 
Now the next part in engineering, we discovered that you could model truth tables with little electrical circuits. That is, you could have a circuit that was an AND circuit, which meant if you had a wire that had current and you had another wire that had current, then the electrical circuit would output current. But if both of those had no current, then no current came out. If the left one had current and the right one didn't, then no current came out. If the left one had no current and the right one had current, no current came out. But if they both had current, then current would come out. So zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, but one, 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 right? You could actually model this in an electrical circuit. Don't start laughing, okay? You're laughing at years of my life. And you're also laughing at all of these smartphones that are in your pockets and these computers and this digital camera and everything else. Because without these circuits, you would not have the age that we live in. So these are models of an AND gate, by the way, that shape means AND. In electrical engineering, different shapes have different meanings. Here's a lovely little op, uh, model of, um, of an AND gate operation. So we studied, here's another one, right, that shows you what the current flows here, the current flows there. Then there. So we actually built these. So here's how you model an AND gate. Here's how you draw an OR gate. There's the not AND gate, the not OR gate, the either. So, because OR can be either one of these, but then there's, that's the inclusive OR. They're called VEL and OUT in logic. Um, but how about it can be either OR or both? See, that's a different logical operator. Make a different electric circuit for it. This is what all your computers are doing. We built these gates. There they are. We studied truth. I did this. Everybody did this. This is like, for me, the equivalent of Legos for Professor Torrent. Yeah. You know, on his birthday, he said he wanted Legos. I said, I want electrical circuits, man, because I know what the future is. Besides, they're more interesting than Legos. And we had to draw. Yeah, I know. Hey, I bet we could build a uh, not AND gate with Legos. Yeah, sure, they probably have already done it, right? Okay, you're getting all this? So you got the truth conditional semantics. You have the computer logic gates, truth tables, logic gates. It's just the same thing you see behind the scene. You see the world looks various with flora and fauna, but you just pull back the curtain, it's all ones and zeros. Ha, ha, okay. But now, and symbolic AI worked very, very hard. We programmed things to do truth tables and so on. Because this approach promised a systematic and formal way to analyze meaning and understand how humans process information and draw inferences. So meaning just was processing information, meaning truth or false about the world, and drawing inferences like syllogisms, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now comes neurons, which I studied. And according to Hebbian doctrine, a neuron receives inputs from other neurons through the axonal arborization, which impinges upon the dendrites and sometimes the cell body of other neurons. What they are sending is essentially electrical, right? It's electrochemical, but it's electrical. It hits the synapse, it releases, opens up on gates on the other side, and then succumbs some chemicals that actually change the voltage potential across the cell body of the neuron. And when the um, differential gets to a certain point, this is called the threshold, then the neuron sends a spike down its axon, or it doesn't. Now, in fact, it usually sends lots of spikes with the like spike, 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 you know, click, 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 when you're hearing something like that in a lab, 
those are spikes going down and act. Well, a spike is a one and no spike is a zero, right? So you got all these neurons doing ones and zeros. And so suddenly the brain, and here, of course, we're completely ignoring all the parts of the brain that are not neurons, which is most of the brain. Um, and that's okay. I can live with that. These neurons are sending out ones and zeros to other neurons. So you have a little thing that is stupid, which is a neuron. But when you take a huge system of very stupid things, it can be very smart. Ones and zeros. Now, and... I teach this stuff, I teach Introduction to Cognitive Neuroscience. I have to say that a neuron is a cell, and there are plenty of really smart single cell organisms, paramecium, amoeba, they can do all kinds of amazing things. They can move, they can eat, they can you know, la 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 la, right? So the idea that a single cell has to be stupid, uh, mm, maybe not, right? Uh, okay, also the cell is highly analog in all kinds of ways and complicated. It has uh, a nucleus, it has stuff in the nucleus. I mean, if you really study a neuron, my, my word, it's an entire universe. But we were able, by this way of thinking, essentially to turn a highly analog system into just a binary digital operator, ones and zeros. So it all lined up. The neuron doctrine, I won't go through. It's fabulous. We could have seven lectures on the neuron doctrine and how it has proceeded. Now, of course, now we know that in addition to wired transmission and synapses, there are C fibers that are wired that do not work on synaptic and synaptic ways. We know that the amount of connectivity even in the neurons is probably 10 times higher than we thought it was. There are gap junctions, there's volume transmission. So just chemical leakage across the brain that is not synaptic. Glial cells, there are more glial cells, astrocytes and so on than there are neurons. Uh, there are patterns, we have a specialist in the back of the room on this, there are patterns of electromagnetic uh, operation across the brain that can't be modeled very well just as ones and zeros from neurons. There are electrically silent generators of brain waves. We didn't think that these could be important for communication or for transmission because they're so small and so weak we couldn't pick them up. We are quite wrong about that. Dendrites turn out to be not passive integrators of inputs but complicated computational units themselves. I mean, what you can do on one little spine of a dendrite computationally, uh, you know, one neuron is fabulous. The computational power inside the neuron is amazing. And there are even those who talk about quantum vibrations, which I will not. Okay, but here, here it was the great vision that I was trying to, truth, conditional theory, main computer logic gates, and the neuron doctrine, it all seemed to be locking together. We were going to take over the world. These were the days of the 1970s when I would go from Berkeley's Evans Hall, uh, electrical engineering and math, down to Stanford. It was the days of hard AI. We would program Hello World. Then we would program Blocks World. So you pick up the block and you put it on. And it would all just scale up. If we did enough of this, we would get to human beings and meaning and robots that were smarter even than you are. Okay. But remember, I was also studying linguistics. And this seemed to me a very poor uh, way to handle all the data. Remember data usage that I was encountering in language. Uh, and, and many other people had the same idea and um, led me in these directions of thinking about uh, things like how you form categories, how uh, English and other languages do not use the logical structures or not restricted to the logical structures of mathematics. I had studied mathematical logic and propositional calculus and first order uh, predicate calculus and on and on and on and on and on. But all the ways in which that was a really bad model for how human beings were working, right? 
uh, frames, constructions, blending. Now this has this, this realization that when you come to language, you need a kind of different system has had little effect really in AI. We can go into it. I'm, I'm skating over half a century of development, um, but it's had little effect until recently. So I want to tell you all 50 years from now, the big picture may look very different to you than it looks now. It may look very different from what you were taught. Don't be surprised by that. Okay. Uh, the field of the study of communication is really in its infancy. Uh, I now work in use and have worked since the 80s in usage based approaches to um, communication. But part of looking at data and usage means you actually have to get data. So I started with Francis Steen, former graduate student of mine, now professor at UCLA. I started with uh, Francis Steen, the distributed little, this, the this international distributed little red hen lab. Now you can go to red hen lab and red hen lab, it's just look up red hen lab. Red hen lab, yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, you're right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to share this thing right here. Now we have to go to Google Chrome share. Okay, now I'm sharing it. Is this where? Yes, you go to Red Hen Lab. All right. Well, where are we going to get data? When I wrote my dissertation, I spent six months getting data. I had file cards, three by five file cards, where I wrote down my data. I made boxes by hand for my little file cards. I still have these boxes and I have these file cards. I read concordances. I went to the library. I irritated the bejesus out of everybody because in conversation, somebody would say something. I'd say, ah, that's really great. And I'd write it down on a card and they would think, of course, that I thought that they were brilliant and said some content that was interesting. But in fact, what I liked was the way they said it. It was data. One of my friends, a PhD in mathematics said, Turner, did anybody ever tell you, you treat your friends like data? <laughs> because I did. So be careful. Don't do this to your friends. They won't uh, love you for it. Okay. Where are we going to get data? Well, we can amass data, we can buy data. So I own all the Disney goofy cartoons. I can let, because I bought them. I mean, I own a copy. And so I can loan it to my students. You want to study Goofy's laughter? Fine, here's Goofy's laughter, right? Well, we put this all in a huge uh, file servers. I have one in case right below my office. It's a 440 terabyte file server. But one way to get um, a lot of data is just by recording TV news. And in the Wild West, by which I mean the United States of America, Section 108 of the U.S. Copyright Act says that libraries and archives can record television news, regardless of who owns it, and loan it to researchers for the purpose of research. Can't share it to the, with the public, but we can loan it to researchers. Right? We don't own the broadcasts, but we can capture them from the air with their closed caption, with all of their metadata. Okay? And we can do that from Brazil. We have a lot of Portuguese from Brazil. We have a lot of Portuguese from Portugal. We have 53 languages. All of the closed captions, which the TV show away. Now, we have lots of other things. We have digital images of pictures. We have pictures of sculptures. We have projects on medieval arts. We have all kinds of things. Um, but the main or the largest component is TV news. Now, luckily, in the United States, the courts consider news to be anything where people are talking about current events. So late night talk shows, stand up comics, making fun of the US president, which isn't that hard to do, no matter what year it is. 
Okay, so we could just capture all of this stuff. We capture uh, the, the, the ant farm from Spain. It goes on for three hours, and they make jokes. We just capture it all. Uh, and this is entirely robotic. It's all being captured right now. About 200 hours of communication will be captured today and processed, and you'll get little thumbnails, and there will be extraction of the closed captions. There will be natural language processing, parsing of the closed captions into grammatical form, and on and on and on. And we're all just, you know, having our Kuiperinias while this is happening. It's all just robot, robotic, okay? There is some human intervention, but it's rare. Here we are. We're all over the world. If you want to know about Red Hen, come find us. If you want to know about how to use the data, Go to Red Hen and type in access, and you'll figure out how you too can get data, real usage. Now, you have to be smart about how you use data. If this is a talk show, you have to know this is a talk show. You don't just mistake it for face-to-face -face communication. But we can put a lot of recordings from behavioral experiments in there. You always have to be sensitive to the data. What are the data? What are the conditions of the data? But you know that. Okay, and we can take your data and put it in Red Hen, and we can run the Red Hen tools on it, and so on. Now, we also run Google Summer of Code. This is our 10th year, and we have people come and do um, projects like make chatty AI. Cool. Now, these are computational approaches. So, where am I in my talk? I'm going to stop share and restare because I have been tutored in how to work. Um, okay. These are computational data science, very big data science tools for working on human communication. You know, you have to have some way to check your hypotheses. You say, well, I think this construction works this way. Well, you have to be able to test it against data. And in the old days, you had to spend six months with your three by five file cards and your boxes getting the data. Now I say to my students, okay, you got a hypothesis, check it out in Red Hat. Just go in there and look for it. Are there uh, processes for doing that? Oh, you bet there are. There are lots of them. Um, so for example, and I'm just gonna say this very quickly, you find this all on Red Hat. We have search engines. We use CQP Web, which is a hypertrophy of the Brazilian national corpus. You want to investigate maybe the construction in English, absent X. What's that, Mark? Well, that's, you say, well, absent a hurricane will be fine on this picture. How does that thing work? The diplomats will, absent financial difficulties, succeed in negotiating this treaty. It's a, it's a quasi-absolutive in English. But it's hard to so suppose you want to understand. That's fine. You write in a certain language, formal language, uh, something that will capture absent with all the other variations. It's not just a word search at all. It searches syntax. It searches grammatical categories and everything. After you've run the closed captions through a parsing system, um, then you can essentially search that parsing system without yourself having to understand much about it. And up comes, and I could do this right now, up comes 10,000 examples in 30 seconds of absence with the context that it's in, and you can click the little button and you will see the person actually speak the phrase that you were reading. And you export this to CSV, you stick it into R, you can run all the statistics and so on. These are standard big data science computational techniques for working on vast amount of data while you're having your Kuiperinia. Okay, so you really want these tools. Okay, but now what has happened, and this is going to be the takeaway here, is that in the study of cognition and communication, we are now in the age of artificial intelligence. Previously in natural language programming, and I did some of this, when you invent natural language parsing, um, uh, natural language processing systems, you had your own ideas about how language worked. 
and you just programmed it to see if you know you could make it work that way and your friends would say ah it didn't work that way it was a mistake now these these symbolic natural language processing parsers are pretty good these days they're a whole lot better than they were in the 1980s we use them all the time we parse the data in red hen you can search using uh, search capacities and features that get the data from the natural language processing parsing. It's all great. But now, so that is really, in a way, symbolic programming working on actual data, searching actual. That's sort of what corpus linguistics and computational corpus linguistics is. However, new times. Uh, now, we have machine learning. And machine learning does not operate by having the programmer, Mark, sit there and figure out how he wants the algorithm to work and using Python or my original programming language with Lisp, try not to laugh, but I still, if I have to do something, I often do it in Lisp and then move it into some other language. There's a cartoon about you are the knight in armor and you have to save the princess. So there you go. But it's always you have to save the princess in C, in C sharp, in Python, in Lisp, right? OK, and then the next panel, you love this comic, uh, Neil. The next panel shows you the outcome of trying to find the princess, save the princess, when you have to use that language. So, for instance, in one language, you go and you get the princess and her furniture and all the food and the tapestry. Ah, wait, I didn't put a limit function on my. <laughs> okay. Now, the one for Lisp is it, just everybody is in little parentheses. When you when you have there's one language where it says you have to save the princess in, and then it's this this is the language is the language people don't like to work in, and the panel is the knight hangs himself because he has to say. Okay, so all, all these plans. Okay, but it's not going and using that. It's turning uh, some kind of convolutional neural network or these days a transformer architecture of machine learning loose on infinite amounts of data. It's just crazy. So you go learn about neural nets, convolutional neural networks, transformers in particular. There is a paper you have to read. It's called All You Need Is Attention or Attention Is All You Need. It's a goofy title. I think they now, they came out of Google. I think they now think that it's a joke. It's an inside joke. I think they now wish this being the most famous paper, an indispensable paper in foundation models, that they had named it something else. But there it is. It's immortal. And the uh, point is, there are a bunch of nodes, and the nodes are connected in layers. And remember those... Uh, feed forward those electrical circuits. Now, when a signal goes from one of these nodes here in this layer to nodes in this layer, you adjust the weights on how important that is. And you have layers, lots of layers, but it's basically an input output machine. It's a function like square. Put in two, you get out four. Put in three, you get out nine. Put in four, you get out 16. Put in 10, you get out 100. That's a function. There are lots of other. Now, the function that is implicit inside your large language model or your transformer is you can't possibly know it. It's infinite. It's incredible. But it, it really is an input output system. All right? So you put in a bunch of prompt, and out comes the next word. By the way, we can do this with images too, but I'll just talk about text uh, for now, right? Outcomes, it's a prediction machine. It's not storing all the things that it's trained on. On the contrary, what it is doing is through linear algebra, creating vectors and there are similarities between the vectors which are just computed by cosines. So Pythagoras in mathematics has come back with a vengeance and it figures out what the most the most likely next word is when you put in a bunch of words. Now, the, that's a little complicated. You go 
learn about that. But the important thing to understand is the amount of data, of ecologically valid data that these things have been trained on, that they can look at, is more data, any one of them, much more data than all the linguists who have ever existed could possibly study in a hundred like lifetimes. It's just so huge, you can't begin to imagine the amount of data that these things have been exposed to. Well, that's good for me because it's usage. You're actually seeing actual data. Um, you, so what, are the, what do you do with them? Well, one of the things I'm gonna do, here's a little advertisement in Google Summer of Code. I've announced that I want people to code at Chatty AI for Red Hin frames and constructions. Because guess what? There's a ton of stuff in the Red Hin website. We published a ton of articles. They're all over. And frames, conceptual frames. There's a lot of literature. And in fact, we have a lot of it that other people don't have because Charles Fillmore's entire private library was given to the torrential team. And um, OK, so it's there, right? So they're all my publications on frames, everybody's publications on frames. But then there's all this work on constructions, the XYZ construction, the what's X doing Y construction, the cause motion construction, lexical constructions, phonological, intonational, super segmental components of constructions and constructions in the visual, in the visual modality and constructions in auditory modal and so on. Maybe modality is the wrong word to use, but you know what I mean, in a variety of different ways to do for me pairs. The ton of study of that, uh, I just reviewed a 280 page book called Multimodal Construction Grammar. It will be coming uh, out, very, very good book. All this technical detail, right? Okay. So you can take all of that, all of those PDFs, all the XML from FrameNet, and train a model or fine tune a model on this data. And the idea is that then there will be a tutor that we can put online. You wanna know something about Red Hen, like how to work for Red Hen, how to get started, where the capture stations are, what do they do, who runs this, what's the history of study of that, how does this, ah, blah, 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 blah. that's okay. You just talk to the chatbot all night long, 24 seven. You know, you don't need Instagram no more. You don't need no Tumblr. You don't need no Snapchat. No, no, you're just gonna talk to my ch chatty AI and you say, okay, so what does the torrential team in Jujapora say about frame blends? And who do they disagree with and so on, right? Okay, now it can get things wrong, but people get things wrong. So that's one thing you can do. That's not the big deal. Um, so I thought when I saw these large language models, you know, everybody's arguing about whether or not they understand language. Are they sentient? Are they intelligent? Are they going to take our jobs? Well, they probably are going to take your jobs, except the phrase is AI is not going to take your job. Somebody who's using AI is going to take your job, right? Uh, but I had to the feeling that since these things have been trained on infinite amounts of data, woohoo! we might be able to use them to help us do linguistics in the sense to get them to cough up, spit out some of their training, some of what they've seen in an organized form. So if you want to know about how a certain kind of construction works, you could maybe use it to ask. If you wanted to expand FrameNet, you could maybe ask. So I was working on a book with uh, Chago Torrent at the time. And I said, Chago, you are Mr. FrameNet. You must be in this project. He said, OK. And then he said, but you know, we really are going to need the expert who can do the experiments and the programming. We need our two. And so I said, yeah, yeah, sure. But let's just make him a co-author. So we did. And so we three started working together. And then I found out that my friend and colleague, Thomas Hoffman, great construction for Marion, had just given a talk on using large language models to search for 
and study constructions. And I said, Chaco, what are we going to do? He said, well, the only thing we could do is like steal all of Thomas's stuff or imitate it with different patterns. And we're not, we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to, and I said, yeah. So I called Thomas and said, you join, join us. Now, Thomas is very um, um, disciplined. And he said, well, I, I can't leap into this. You guys have done all this work. I can't put my name on it. We said, oh, yes, you can. So we ended up with a book which is in print and is now being raffled off in Instagram, a signed copy. And whoever gets it, if you need that fourth signature, send it to me because I'm going to go see Thomas Hoffman in Bavaria at the end of April so we can work on our book, right? And I'll get it signed and I will FedEx it back to you or DHL or whatever you prefer. Okay, uh, you can also use large, these, these transformers, not LLMs, but those are large language models, but you can use them for visual communication. You remember I talked about the Buddhist monk, and long ago I made in Flash a, represent, a visual representation of the Buddhist monk, right? You remember seeing these kinds of things. My guy can't walk or anything like that, but, you know, so it, it, the Buddhist monk, and the solution is uh, the places where the monk meets himself. So this is my best effort. I was really proud in Flash that I could do it. I just took this one and I took up the Flash and dumped it on. And then, hey, that's great. I've been using this all over the world. So I said to Dali 3, hey, here's the riddle of the Buddhist monk. I need a representation of when the Buddhist monk meets himself on the path. But I did have to correct it because the first one it gave me is he's meeting himself and he's like, you know, shaking hands and so happy to meet. I said, no, no. And the monks have to not look aware of each other. Okay. So it gives me this. Boom. 10 seconds. All right. Now, these things have been trained on infinite amounts of images. Also, there's Sora, which has been trained on infinite amounts of video. So the general idea kind of a sloppy idea. We're here present at the creation that there's been a ton of data in communication that these things are trained on. And we might be able to trick them into helping us find patterns because, you know, human beings are really very terrible at finding patterns. If you ask people who are not trained in linguistics, how they speak, how they make sentences, how they, they will tell you how they do it. They're completely and demonstrably wrong. Even when you show them that they're completely and demonstrably wrong about their theories of how they're doing it, doesn't matter. They're just going to they're just going to do that. It's hard, although you're a complete master of these constructions. It's very very hard to figure out what you're actually doing because they're in the backstage of cognition, where all most of the power is. It's extremely hard to see what you're actually doing in consciousness. So, you all see it coming. You can take co-pilots for linguistics and you can in fact stick it into a large language model or feed it as fine tuning. And now you can have a chat bot for the book. So we wrote this book to do this kind of stuff. So I'm now going to show you one kind of thing, just one, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen because I will reshare the screen when I go over. The rest of this is just in the browser. Red Hen, Red Hen Lab, you've seen that. Let us get rid of Zoom and let's go here. Windows, chat AI PDF, that's probably it. Yes, okay, so here's one thing you can do. I'm going to, you're going to be seeing here. Oh, yes, thank you. Share screen. I go over here to Zoom. I share my screen. It takes a village. Okay. 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 Yeah, I see it. Okay. So what did I do? I did this at breakfast this morning. Usually in ancient history, which means like eight weeks ago, I thought that in order to do any of these kinds of things, I was going to have to go into my system 
in the Case Western Reserve University High Performance Computing Lab and use GPUs to train my transformer architecture on things. But now, Gemini, which used to be BART in ancient history four weeks ago, um, OpenAI, ChatGPT4, when we were writing the book, we were using ChatGPT3 and 3.5. So the book is not about the, a present technical state. It's about the theory of using linguistic inquiry to prompt large language models as tools to help you do linguistics. So that's why it's called co-pilots for linguists. Okay. So this morning at breakfast, I'm having eggs, orange juice, and coffee, I open up OpenAI. Uh, so I didn't do it in Microsoft Pilot, Copilot. I didn't do it in Gemini. I did it in OpenAI, but you can do it in any of these things. I said, hi, I'm going to give you a PDF. You can just give it a PDF. And then I'm going to ask it, and then I'm going to ask you questions. So I fed our book, guys. I fed our book, and then you can ask it questions. So it takes one minute for it to digest the book. And then I ask it a question and it answers in two seconds is there an unconstruction in english how does it work yes the unconstruction in english is a fascinating linguistic feature that involves the prefix un being added to verbs the construction primarily denotes the reversal of the action indicated by the verb to which it is attached for instance when un is prefixed to button forming unbutton it changes the meaning to reverse a buttoning action. Similarly, untied, blah, 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 blah. This construction is notable. Blah, blah. So you want to know what's in our book? Well, you can ask. You can just ask the chat bot. Now, your administrators are not going to tell you that it's sink or swim, but I will. So I teach a class. One of the books I assign is one of my books. That thing is 220 pages. I have vast exam to check that people have read it chapter by chapter. So I fed it not to open AI. I, I did this in Google. I made a chat bot on my book, right? So it's a large language model that has been a little bit of retrieval of minute generation on my book. Opened it to them. They can just ask what's in the book. I gave it the test. It got an A. Okay. In, in no time at all. This is the reality. It's on your phones. All of the students have it. Do not think you can tell people not to use it. They don't have any choice when they are in productivity software like Word or Excel or PowerPoint or Keynote or Pages or Sheets or anything else. It's right there. It's, you click the button. And it will fill in the Excel coding. But in, in, on the coding and these kinds of things, it's very frequently better than my students, right? It's right there. It's in Spotify. It's in Photoshop. It's in, it's in, it's in, it's in everything. Okay, so that's just the, I hope you're terrified now or excited. And I can show you things that it does. So here is OpenAI. By the way, if you haven't seen Sora create videos from text, so you give it a little bit of text and tell it, I want a scene in a Japanese street where somebody's walking by, blah, boom, there's the video. If you haven't seen that, you need to go see that. But it's all, you, you, you're 50, view from 50,000 feet. It's all the same. These things with like transformer architectures have been trained on massive amount, massive amount, in unimaginably large amounts of ecologically valid data. And the question is always, now that it has been trained this way to generate, can you trick it into helping you study the patterns, the constructions, the systematicity of these communicative uh, systems? So you can feed documents to your AI drive. So here are some. There's Copilots for Linguistics. This is my book for CogSci. This is an early virtue, uh, version of the brilliant yet to be published book on future mind. So you can ask it kind of things and let us go over to here because I want to make certain that you see 
that you can also do this in Copilot. So when you're in office, whether it's on the web or in on your, um, you have the app on your computer, Copilot is sitting right here. Just click. Yeah, I'm coming back. You can see me. Copilot is sitting right there. Right? It's that little yeah. colored thing, right? Okay. You click. Okay, and you can ask it things. So look, let's look at what. So here's a demonstration. And after this little demonstration, I'm going to ask you if there's anything you're working on at the linguistic summer in at summer school. Anything that you'd like to help on. So I said to it last night, last night, act as if you are a frame semanticist. You have thoroughly studied FrameNet, which is presented at this website. That's where you go to FrameNet. You see the frames, the XML. You can just all go look at it. But so can Gemini. So now I'm in Google. You see their presentation of frame for gradable attributes, whose definition is as follows, quote, an entity has an implicit value for an attribute. That's like, you know, how hot is it? Temperature is an attribute. It's got a value. So it's probably 82 degrees Fahrenheit out there, maybe 27 Celsius, something like that. Degree expresses either explicit comparison or the deviation of the value when compared with other entities of a similar kind. The value may hold only relative to a particular time or in a particular circumstances. That's just quoted right out of frame. Net. Core frame elements in this frame are entity and degree. Core unexpressed frame elements are attribute and value. The color frame inherits the gradable attributes frame. Core frame elements in the color frame are entity and color. The color frame is evoked by adjectives such as azure, beige, blue, orange, pink, red, among others. Now, propose other semantic frames inheriting the gradable attribute frame. Present them as a table in which the columns are frame name, frame definition, frame elements, frame element definition and words evoking the frame. Yeah, that's a pretty sophisticated ask, right? You just take some information from FrameNet, you say, hey, I'd like to explore this gradable attribute thing. Are there some others? I gave you one, color, but how about some others, right? So this is prompt Gemini for Case Western Reserve University because I'm using the enterprise version of um, of uh, Gemini uh, VPNing to my university it says, here you go, semantic frames inheriting gradable attribute frame. Here are the frame names like temperature, found temperature, size, age, loudness, speed. And it gives you, it proposes a frame definition. An entity has an implicit temperature value, temperature. It gives you entities. It gives you words that evoke these. It and so on, right? Now, might be wrong. Notice it didn't go and get these off FrameNet. It can propose frames that are not in FrameNet because FrameNet is actually very thin. Its coverage is very slight, certainly for languages other than English. So you can say, it's not like this is a lookup, it's going to FrameNet and pulling up things that are in FrameNet. It has been trained on FrameNet and it is generating, it's predicting stuff that might inherit the gradable attribute frame. It might get some things wrong, no doubt. It might especially if it's working in a language other than English, it might uh, uh, make judgments that are, it's not making judgments. It might generate text that the human expert would not. You can export this to an Excel spreadsheet 
And the way you do just do that is say, uh, make certain to export this to an Excel spreadsheet. So it does. You can also do this. So that's Google. You can also do this, which I did. Here's the table and it's different that you get from chat GPT. It's a different foundation model. It produces some different proposals, but there is overlap. Very interesting. You can do this in Microsoft Copilot, which I did. So notice I'm not going into Case Western Reserve University with my GPUs and no, 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 now in the last six weeks, right here in the browser, you can kind of get rolling. And this is being used in some interesting ways. So for instance, my university had an AI task force, which I called the cover your ass force because the university was terrified about AI, did not want, know what to do, got together 40 faculty members and said, what shall we do? We produced the report of the task force and it's actually got some substance to it. It's not, because I said, listen, we can't do this if it's just going to be, oh, AI is very important. We're in the age of bleeding in the AI and we have to support it and faculty are great and they need great things. And also there should be a committee that goes on forever and we need $10,000 and acknowledging all the diversity in the students and the wonderfulness of like no is this going to happen there are hard questions to ask here what we have to do is give some principles for the university to use to navigate their way into the future in the age of ai so we made a chatbot and trained it on the task force report it's now available and what we sent to the president was not the report because and the provost i mean they're not no, we send them in the chatbot. Here, ask, ask anything you want, and you can talk to the chatbot about it. We also have done it for courses. How do I get this course? Do I have to have this course for my major? Can I substitute this course for that course? Who needs to sign to say that I can substitute this course for that course? Can I graduate? When will I graduate, right? So it's been trained on all these infinitely tedious documents about enrollment. We have one for HR. Hi, can I switch my my health benefits plan? But back to linguistics. Notice that um, Microsoft Copilot uh, also produces just what you ask it to produce, and it's different. Not radically different. They've all got basically the same kind of structure, but they come up with slightly different LUs, lexical units. They come up with some different frames that inherit the gradable attributes and so on. Now, this is not replacing the expert or the student. These things are, it can't. And if you use something and it produces something, you are responsible if you use that thing. It lands on you. You can't just say, well, teacher, it's not my fault. This is what the chatbot said, right? But not only you, but your teachers can, properly done, with discipline, now use existing AI to help them study usage, actual, ecologically valid data. This has become like computational corpus linguistics, red hen, all those other kinds, this has become a tool that is available inside the study of communication. It is an extremely different tool from the ones that I was trained on when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley in 1971. Things have changed. Things have changed. And instead of just rolling over, and being terrified and you know chicken little and things like are the students going to cheat how will i know if the essay that somebody wrote was written by them or chat gpt by the way if anybody tells you that there's ai that can tell whether or not it was created by an ai forget it it doesn't work and it's an arms race well how about if you put a water stamp in there great how about if you remove the water stamp because you know you, you can be smart about this, right? So you, you're getting it, you've got it, it's here. And it's here for the linguistic summer school. It's here for Jujifora. It's in all of your classes. 
we use it to try to help us do linguistics. We are in a new age. And to wrap up uh, our new age, what I would like to say is I'm sitting right here looking at Gemini, ChatGPT, and Microsoft Copilot. Bing, bing, bing. These are all these are all available to you. You don't have to go and learn how to transform our views. You don't have, you know, these are all available to you right now. The wrap up, and you, this could come in through the chat, is, and by the way, all of this I did in less than the last 24 hours, and I also went out to dinner with my wife and Neil, and this was just trivial. You know, I had did this at breakfast, right? Okay, who has got a project inside linguistics that they're working on, and they'd like some data, or they'd like some suggestions? or they have a question about what the heck they're doing. Who's actually right now doing some research on something linguistic? I want a question for our co-pilots and I want to ask them and I want to see what we get. And I don't know what we will get. This is a teachable moment. One of the things you will see is that very much depends upon prompt engineering. You can get no help at all by asking the wrong thing. And you can get a lot of help by, by asking the right thing, but you have to work on what it means to ask the right thing. You will also see, or you would see if we did this for an hour, lots of great things where you'll go, ooh, ooh, and other things where you'll go, oh, boy, that's just really wrong, right? So I need one. We're not, we cannot close until somebody self helps me out with an actual research question. I will call on people if you don't give me one. I'm from Southern California. You can't run and you can't hide. So you might as well give it up now. Speak out. How can we use Oh, great. A text-based approach for teaching English to medical students. Yeah. Great. Now, all over the world, you have to understand this question is being asked. Because when people have to teach, they have to put together a syllabus. They have to have assignments. People have to read. Okay. So... Now you're gonna help me on the prompt here. Prepare a syllabus for a class. It's one semester? Yeah. Good. Semester, by the way, these things like elaborate prompts, much better than short prompts. So much so that now these systems will take your prompt and rewrite it into a fuller prompt. And they'll often do that by including information that you would not have included. But they just need more specifics, right? So they'll just put them in themselves. And then maybe you won't like it. And you'll say, well, wait a minute. I didn't say anything about that. Why did you do that? The answer is because it's trying to make a fuller, more specific prompt to get rolling. So if you find you're getting back you know, tapioca pudding in response to your prompt, hey, try again. And also be careful. Now they have memory. So the prompt is not only this prompt. When we're when I started working on GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, not chat, but GPT-2, GPT-3, it was you only look once. It was like YOLO. Just this is the prompt. This is the output. And you can't say to it, oh, no, what I want you to do is to change the rabbit into a monkey. No, no, because it doesn't. No, this prompt is the only thing it's adding to its large language model. Now, not so. It can remember, for it, or it has access to what's going on for a very, very long time. So if you find that it gets stuck giving you certain kinds of it, that might be because you said something earlier and it says, okay, that's what this dude wants. And you just can't get it off it. So you learn, go to a new chat, start over, right? 
And so you have to kind of understand how it's working and where the effect is. Prepare a syllabus for a one semester course at the undergraduate level. in technical writing for medical students in English, or just in, in uh, the English, in learning English, where the students are Brazilian, right? Uh, medical students. Medical students, okay? Be sure to include textbooks, textbook suggestions, um, assignments, how, how many weeks? 15. For 15 weeks, um, more, anything else? Uh, You're the expert. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, you could say uh, using the cautions against plagiarism. Yeah. Anything else? And focusing on communicative. And focusing on communicative. By the way, is I've talked to instructors of second languages, and there is a, that term, communicative or discourse. Yeah where you, you need you learn it by engaging in discourse right so what's the right technical term for that communicative pedagogy communicative yeah who, who can help okay. communicative it's not really uh that's the problem with the the, the terminology with the teacher on uh on, it will know with the it, it will know i mean one of the things you could ask is how do i refer to that kind of Teach communicative, inclusive, and discursive approaches. Okay? So let's just see. English for medical professionals. Instructor, your name, office hours, email, course description. This one semester course is designed to equip Brazilian medical students with the necessary English language skills to excel in their academic and professional careers. Through a communicative, right. inclusive, and okay, this one semester course is designed to equip Brazilian medical students. Slower, this despacito. Uh, Brazilian medical students, tengo que bailar contigo. Uh, Brazilian medical students with the necessary English language skills to excel in their academic and professional careers through a communicative, inclusive, and discourse-based approach. By the way, did, you saw I didn't like my saying discursive. You wrote discourse. The, yeah, okay, it didn't like just discourse, now we have discourse-based, thank you. Approach, students will develop their abilities in reading, writing, listening, and speaking medical English course objectives. By the end of this course, students will be able to understand and critically analyze medical research articles and textbooks, effectively communicate medical information to patients, colleagues, and other healthcare professionals, write clear and concise medical reports, emails, and presentations, participate confidently in discussions and presentations of medical topics, demonstrate an awareness of ethical considerations in medical communication required textbook, academic English for medical professionals. It probably d didn't find one. <laughs> That's probably a fifth. But supplementary materials, online medical journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Lancet, TED Talks on healthcare related topics, coursework and grading class participation, 20%, weekly quizzes, 20%, midterm exam, 25%, two hour written exam, case presentation, study presentation, 20%, final research paper, 15%, assignment schedule, subject to change. Week one, introduction and course overview, self-introduction, needs analysis, it's uh, medical terminology, vocabulary building exercises, quiz one. So we didn't tell it anything about we need to start with some vocabulary. 
uh, reading medical text, listening comprehension, midterm exam, scientific writing basics, case study introduction, blah, 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 blah. Now, academic integrity, got to have that in there. Discourse-based learning, this course emphasizes, a, and it's going to tell you what that is. Inclusive learning environment, communication. Please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions or concerns. Additional notes, attendance is expected in every class. Late assignments will be penalized. Students with disability abuse are encouraged to contact the University Disability Service. I look forward to a productive and successful semester. Now, so do I. Now, I could, this is just a first pass. I'm, I'm entirely certain that if I told Gemini that it needs to use its search engine, which I didn't do, it is not searching to do this, but you just hit the little button and suddenly it is going to go and use Google search, which it wasn't doing, that I could find you those textbooks or it under my prompt would find you those textbooks and articles. Um, OpenAI has uh, MyWeb. It's a, it's a GPT, you just click on the MyWeb and then it says, okay, I now I know that to answer this, I'm supposed to consult not only my large language model, but also this text they gave me. And I'm supposed to look on the web in Microsoft Copilot, of course they use Bing. So you'd get this, if no, like we could get 35 articles and books on academic or professional English for medical students, nothing but. Okay, now notice that wasn't really a question to help the linguists do linguistics, but it was a question on how these things can help the linguist teach language or linguistics or anything else. And also, you know, you see this in the linguist in me instantly wants to start talking about discourse constructions. You know, when I was raised in linguistics at the beginning, sort of the idea was linguistics ended at, at the sentence. There were certain, I, I have drawn more trees, syntactic trees of sentences in my life than anybody should ever have to draw. But it wasn't until I bumped into the discourse grammarians, the discourse linguists, and I started thinking about um, discourse constructions, like, for example, you know, the opening sentence of a short story is different. You will interpret the opening sentence of a, sh of a short story differently if it had been placed as the last sentence. Chapter break is a discourse construction. And on and on and on and on. And on. Okay, one of the things you see here is we recognize gene generic conventions for the syllabus, form, meaning, pairs for the syllabus. So the linguist might say, okay, this thing can generate a lot of these things. I'm going to use this to try to write a little article on the construction grammar of the syllabus. I'm a discourse grammarian. And I'm going to ask it, what are the components? What are the possibilities? What are the variations? What doesn't work? What are the constraints? That kind of thing. This is not going to replace the linguist. But we're now in an age where if you want to, you can use these things as co-pilots. Got a question? I was going to give you another prompt. Let's hear another prompt. Based on what you just uh, said. Shall we move? We, let's move from Gemini to ChatGPT. What if you have, in line with what you just said, asking what conventional and opening lines of the story are? Excellent. To see if it can find the constructions that are involved. In Excellent. So you're going to help me write the prompt. Within construction grammar, there is a field that studies. the nature of constructions, that is, form, meaning, pairs, that operate at the le a level larger than a single sentence. For example, 
we may know that a particular or that a specific sentence is the opening sentence of a fantasy novel that involves supernatural or unusual agents such as elves, leprechauns, gods. Give me some others. Superheroes. Pardon me? Fairies, of course. Lizards? Okay. No, there are people who think that there are no such things as birds. Those birds are all robots from Mars, right? Wizards. I like lizards. Uh, um, uh, uh, lizards that are actually uh, aliens in disguise, or super, actually uh, super intelligent aliens disguise, and so on. But do not feel restricted to those specifics. Propose for the review of your professor who is a discourse linguist, uh, a discourse construction grammarian, um, a taxonomy of ways that we interpret the first sentence in such a fantasy novel. So when you do use these things, you spend a long time sort of learning how to stick it with your needle so that it gives you back the thing that you like. And you'll very quickly start to not do some things and always to do some other things. And there are a zillion YouTube videos that will give you introduction to prompt engineering for how to write your fantasy novel. I'm serious. Let's see what we get. Here's a proposed taxonomy for interpreting the first sentence in a fantasy novel from the perspective of discourse and structure grammar. One, world building construction. The first sentence establishes the setting or the world of the fantasy novel as construction uh, yeah, I gotta go back. Uh, you're a little too fast for me, and I will be louder and slow down. This construction provides a backdrop against which the story unfolds, setting the stage for the fantastical elements to come. Now, I take this as true. When I read the first sentence of a fantasy novel, I'm very likely to think that it is performing world building or giving me some idea of how unusual this world is going to be. I know that there are different kinds of moves in world building. I'm trying to figure out which one this is going to be. It might be just a lead in to the world building and so on, but but I, there I am. I'm primed with those kinds of things. Example, in the land of Eldoria, where magic weaves through the very fabric of reality, a legend was about to unfold. Character introduction construction. The first sentence introduces a key character, often with hints at their supernatural or unusual attribute. You understand how it's doing this. It's got its vectorization. It's got its weights. It is predicting the next word, the most likely next word. And then I added new words. And it goes through this and this, all given that these are the words that it has now heard. What's the most likely next word? That's what it's doing. Chomsky complains that this is autocomplete on steroids and not interesting. It is autocomplete on steroids, but it might be very useful to you as a prompter, as an interlocutor. By the way, I think there is a little bit there on the AI that we ought to pay attention to. So give me something that I'm not completely ignorant of. Just give me any topic, any. 
Come on. Give me a topic to talk about. Motorcycles. Good. <laughs> the crucial thing to understand about a motorcycle is that it has, in contrast to a car, only two wheels. Your body on a motorcycle is not substantially in control of the balance of the car. No, there are suspension systems to handle that for you. But on a motorcycle, your ass is the thing that controls the movement, the verticality of that machine. And you have, as the motorcycle driver, the prime objective, not of turning the steering wheel, there is no steering wheel, but maintaining your uprightness. Okay, now, do you think I had all of that when you said motorcycles? Did you? So I had the syntax right, I had embedded clauses, I had, I had, I had. Do you think when I started each of those sentences, I knew where the sentence was going to go? No. I'm wayfinding. At any moment, there is the past of what I have said, and there are possibilities for completing that. This is really crucial. So you look at Proust or Henry James or some of your friends who seem to speak not just full paragraphs, but full articles. And you wonder how they can do it. But in fact, part of the human communicative ability is to wayfind through possibility spaces, filling in to make something that in retrospect actually looks competent. Okay? So you're not doing autocomplete, but you're highly creative. You are always, when you're talking with people, launching and navigate, right? So um, I think that even given that this predictive capacity is what these things are using, it makes me curious about how the human predictive capacity and completion works. How does that, I know I'm not doing it because I vectorized something and I'm using cosine some other lots of ways in which what it's doing and what I'm doing manifestly must be different. But still, there's the question of what I've done. Character introduction, the first sentence introduces, you know, we did that example, a lone figure. Remember this, the first sentence of fantasy novel. A lone figure cloaked in shadows whispered ancient words that set the stars alight. Atmospheric constructions. The first sentence creates a mood or atmosphere that is indicative of the fantasy genre, often using vivid imagery or evocative language to immerse the reader in a sense of wonder or mystery. Example, the night air was alive with the hum of enchantments, casting a luminous glow over the forest, right? Narrative hook constructions, thematic constructions, these constructions are not mutually exclusive and can overlap. Very good. You could have a first notice, by the way, you have this first sentence. You don't have to say, is this a world building or is this a character introduction? Maybe it's both, right? These constructions are not mutually exclusive. Okay. So if you actually wanted to do this, you could, what, very often we get ideas by talking to other people. We say something and they say something back to us. They might even say, I don't understand. And then you try again, right? These things are always there. They've been trained on massive data. The pos it's sink or swim. You're getting it. You can always use them. This is a moment. So the title of this talk is AI Cognition and Multimodal Communication. And the take home is in my lifetime, what, how AI has changed for those of us, the role of AI for those of us who work in the study of multimodal communication has dramatically changed and the acceleration is robust. Thank you very much for your patience. Can I share your computer mic? Of course. So uh, we do have some time for questions due to microphone restrictions. 
if uh, anyone here in the audience has a question, just raise your hand and I can say it louder to the mic. Uh, and if anyone on uh, YouTube has a question, just post it to the chat and I can read it as well. So, any questions? Yes, yes. and now that I understand that, in fact, we are um, using the mic right here. Mm -hmm. I believe I can go to the sound settings and increase what's called the gain on the input. So here's my input. Yes, I can. My input volume. So now we're louder, right? You're louder there in cyberspace. You like that? Is it too loud? It's good. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Lies? Uh, I do have a question. Uh, my, you know, maybe some small story. Uh, short story. Do you need a microphone? No, the microphone doesn't work there. Okay. I can. Yes. You will repeat. Uh, a friend of mine uh, applied uh, an article with paper some time ago, and she was uh, terrified because the, the check, the GPT or the AI check, got 90 something percent and she she told me i didn't use it i didn't use it at all i didn't know what to do so she changed it uh just the word yeah and uh, uh the the check got it like 10 percent yes just for changing yes. eight words yes so uh uh I think the, the, the more natural, that some text uh, uh, really, uh, you can see it was GPT, it was uh, an AI, right? Like a uh, narrative, for example. But if you get uh, this uh, uh, more formal, the, the, the paper structure, or uh, um, I don't know the name, it's certainty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, you have a uh, I think it, it's pretty hard to know if 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 you use it the, the AI or not. Uh, so I think there is a, a problem. The more natural the, the AI gets, it's gonna be even harder to know if there is a AI or not. Yeah. So this is a question about telling, evaluating a product for whether it was generated by a human or an AI, okay? Yeah. I'm not your professor here. Uh, I'm not a representative with the Federal University of Juju Flora, so I can just tell you what I think. You're doomed. You're not, for, just forget it. There's not a hope. Now, the president of Harvard University just had to resign because in her dissertation, and, and she's a scientist, a psychologist, and so on. So her dissertation was about experiments and statistics and blah, blah. But in her acknowledgments and in a few other places, they found that she had essentially used sentences that could be found in other acknowledgments, okay? She had to resign because of this. Now, our feeling in the academy is pretty much Look, you're a scientist, we want to know about your ideas. Did you steal your ideas and your results from some, did you make them up, right? Okay, we're worried about, we're not worried about the sentence you put in your acknowledgement thinking your father said, but the Harvard code is if a student gets caught repeating the words of somebody else, that's plagiarism and you have to flunk them and in many cases expel them from the university. So, justice, if the student is going to get expelled, and they had all these little students who had been expelled, but the president does, it's fine? No, no. So it was just a terrible, terrible mess. Human beings are built to repeat what they have heard. There are any number of sentences that you say that you've heard from other people. You quote poetry. So I'll give you just a little funny story. Uh, yeah, you're telling me that I should wrap up? No, so I had a follow-up Yeah, but wait, you just wait. So <laughs> one of the things that happened to me, because I give talks to neuroscientists, I speak at law schools about how to invent concepts of law that people can actually understand. 
because if the people don't understand the law, they're not going to follow it. If the judges don't understand the law, they're going to make goofy rulings. If the jury doesn't understand the law, it's going to look as if they're engaging in nullification. I speak to engineers. I speak to linguists. I speak, speak, speak to. So guess what? Some of the times, some of what I say to one group, I have to say to the other group. Like, hey, you want to know what Lynn Talmy's force dynamics are? Because we got to have it. So there's a page and a half of summary of Lynn Talmy's force dynamics or something like that. Or introducing frame net. Well, I just go and cut it from the quarry and stick it in in that spot because this is my little honed introduction to image schemas or something like that. I did this once for an article that I didn't even want to contribute. But the nation that had invited me said, no, we have to have a conference proceedings. I said, I don't have a whole new uh, talk to give you. I do not have a whole new paper to give you, but I can give you this talk. They said, great. And then they said, no, no, now we have to put it in the conference proceedings. I said, well, listen, this paper's already published. They said, that's fine. That's fine. So I rewrote the paper a little. I gave it to them with the same title and a footnote that said, this article has been substantially published in another place. They ran it through one of these systems, and they wrote back to me, you have plagiarized this article from Mark Turner. <laughs> okay, this is a this is a face plant. This is you just have to assume that this stuff is everywhere. So what I said to my students, my most recent students in undergraduate classes, but I also do it with graduates. Is listen, use the AI. I'm going to teach you how to use the AI. I'm assuming you're using the AI to help you. That's not a problem. Now show me that you can do better than the AI. This stuff is already in everything, trying to tell your students that they can't use it or shouldn't use it or something like that. I think that's doomed. I think that's literally doomed. You can't stop it. Megan. Going back to your, um, your, your wonderful examples of the opening sentence of the fantasy they weren't. Notice they weren't mine. They were. No, but what I've seen is that no sooner does somebody identify that all the best fantasy novels start with a particular kind of sentence, then you have a class teaching everybody that they need to start their fantasy novel with a specific sentence. So do you So mediocrity and standardization, well, the thing we would do is immediately ask the chatbot, the LLM. We'd say, listen, we could do it right here. You have listed the most standard openings, but I would like to be a distinctive writer. I would like to be known for openings that are effective but different and see what it gives you. Go ahead. I just went in the other direction. Yeah. We've all seen people who receive information from professors or teachers or something in a certain style. Yeah. And they repeat back that style because yes. they know that's what makes them sound smart. Yes. So do you see a feedback loop where people get their information from AI? And then we all start talking more and more like AI yeah, 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 yeah. in order to sound like we know what we're Absolutely, about. and there are zillions of discussions about this. Just yeah, just so people can follow us. The, I'm sorry. The question is, if uh, Mark sees this loop, so the more people use AI to get ideas on how, for example, to open novels or their scientific papers, the more they will sound like AI, right? And then we'll be in this infinite loop of... AI discourse likeness. Yes, absolutely. These are dangerous, and these dangers are not hypothetical. These dangers are real. This has been run. There are experiments on it. You take, and it's not just the AI talks to the human. The human talks like the AI. The AI talks like the human. Blah 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 blah, and they both end up sure. They also, we've got wonderful things where you take the AI talking to another AI, and they start to imitate each other, and they start to converge, right? Yep, that's in the nature of the it's in the nature of the case. You're just going to have to use your brain. So if there are a lot of things that that you think might be coming, yes, they are. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> just get on top of it. You know, if I were there was a band called the Cars. Nobody knows about the Cars anymore, but they had a song. Let the good times roll, right? 
Okay, I think you just gotta let the good times roll because you're getting it. Marcelo, were you gonna? Uh, you were. He, 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 knows he knows the cars, but he's Marcelo, right? Okay. Yeah, we should all get out our guitars and play. Let the good times roll, but because it's sink or swim, you're getting it. If you're not using it, the person next to you, next to you is is. Sorry. So I'm going to move to the last question. It's coming from YouTube. It's Cid Oliveira from Vissosa asks, so in this age of AI, what do you see as the role of corpus annotation? Ah, corpus annotation, the ground truth of human beings is where it all started. So for example, I just said, and this is true, and I stand by it. You can use the LLMs to code. You can use it to code in Python. You can use it to code your Excel spreadsheet. And by now, it's better than most of my students. It really is, especially since you compile it, you get one error message, you tell it, hi, there's an error in this line. You, or you just, in fact, you just click a button and it corrects, it sees the error message. You, you haven't even done the work to understand the error message. It corrects the error and then it compiles. It's, if you're not using a co-pilot work while you're coding, you're just not a coder. I mean, they're, they're all open now. Now, the way that happened is when they made the first large language models, they just trained it on anything available. And that included Reddit and other kinds of things like GitHub. And guess what? A whole lot of those texts are code and people saying, I can't quite do this. And somebody else coming in and saying, try this, do this, blah, blah. So the way you think of, if you're not a coder, the way you think coding works from the movies is there's somebody who's like in a matrix of screens <laughs> and they're all flashing colors and, and they're going. <laughs> and I can tag really fast and they're just controlling the world. And everything. Okay, the YouTube video will show you how coding really works. So somebody, you know, types in something and it comes back and it doesn't compile and you copy <laughs> it and you go to the internet and you paste in this, it, it comes back and it takes you to a page and said, yeah, I have the same problem in my code and I tried this <laughs> and you <laughs> copy that and you come back and you put it in your code and then it works and you do that for every line, right? That's true, okay? Now, all of that was data that this thing was trained on. It was a complete surprise that these things could code, could generate code. You'd say, ChatGPT, write me HTML that would be rendered as the splash page for a website with a blue back background and a little bird flying over a frog. Well, bang, there was the HTML. You put it in. Sweet mother of God, here is your, your web page. Okay. The reason it can do it is because human beings are essentially annotating all the problems. They're doing it in Reddit. They're saying it's this, it's not that. Oh, this bird is this, it's not that. Human beings in all kinds of fields have commented, they have provided. That's why these things can do these things. So for instance, all those human annotators in FrameNet produced manually all those frames. FrameNet is not computational. What? Did I say that? What I mean is you go to FrameNet, and yes, there's a web rendering of this is the frame, and this is what it, okay, there's a web render, rendering, and you can get the XML for that, right? But FrameNet is not like I give it a sentence and tell me what frames these are, and it tells you. But all of that annotation can be used as data for the foundation model. To, so what I would say is this is where everything begins. This is the crucial thing. If you want these things to do better, basically what you need is human annotation. Reinforcement learning through human feedback is essentially a system 
of annotation. The thing produces this output, you annotate, it brings it back in and it changes its behavior. These are not systems that were dropped from Mars. These are systems that essentially exploit the existence of a universe of human work. And they get better by having more human work. It's just that, you know, these things are like a nuclear bomb or something. They're just, they, they, the way in which they can leverage the work that the human being do, is doing is awesome. And they can do that for better and for worse. So if you want to have a campaign that misleads the whole world and gets them to go to war and is terrible to people and stuff, these things can really help, okay? Because they bring you powers. They are tools. We have to decide how to use these tools. Everybody kind of knows that. Our little intervention was, you know, they're tools that can actually help the researcher in language because that's not <laughs> something anybody else was looking at. That's it. Yeah. So... Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Uh, just a final reminder for those uh, registered for the workshop on corpus data. You know, just making advantage of the question about corpus annotation. Uh, it's going to be this afternoon uh, exclusively on the Zoom webinar, right? For those who have registered, you already got the link. Okay. So thank you all. And mm, I'm sorry. Okay, but Photo. people on YouTube didn't look very well. Okay, yeah. so thank you all. Uh, thank once again to all the interpreters who made this uh, such an inclusive event. <laughs> and see you when we find the strength to hold uh, to host another linguistic summer school. So see you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>